Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to another edition of Common Law Rights Society. I'm your host, Greg Ward, and tonight we will we will be talking about the private express trusts that uh, so many of you guys have heard about. The Common Law Private Express Trust, also known as a Massachusetts, a Massachusetts Trust, uh, Massachusetts Business Trust, uh, what else? Um, sometimes referred to as a private trust. Uh, but it's a non-statutory trust. So that's the important thing to distinguish. This is a private express trust, meaning it is written down, it is expressed, um, and it, it is not statutory. It is formed under the common law right of contract that every uh, man and woman of adult age can create of their own of their own right, what they call su juris. So, uh, your brother Greg here uh, really believes in the importance of your rights, and so we always are on the search for ways that you could discover your rights that were given to you by the Creator that is not reliant upon any outside source. And uh, when uh, we studied these things, we found trust law to be at the root of um, pretty much all things in our society today. And so when we discovered the private express trust at the common law, we discovered that, in our opinion, this form of trust is on a same level of authority, if you will, as the state itself. Because remember, all things originate in, con in contract law. Uh, again, this is not legal advice, this is just uh, one man's opinion, but I believe it's a good opinion after a lot of research. Of course, please leave your comments and your thoughts below. Um, but it is, a, it is of our opinion that contract law rules, right? If you have, uh, and bear with me, humor me, right? If you, uh, whether you believe in, in the creator or not, um, the creator overall created all people to be equal and gave everyone equal rights. And those rights existed. Um, basically, you had the free will, right? As long as you did not trespass upon anyone else's rights. So the basic common law existed in the form of you could not trespass. That's where we get trespass from. We don't trespass on each other's properties. And we don't trespass upon each other's bodies. Um, and then as far as um, your right to create uh, an agreement with another human being, that's your right of contract, of agreement. You also have that right. So you have the right to say yes, and you have the right to say no. Right. So that is, that is where we get consent to the govern from. And that's where all governments that are free governments that are created by the consent of the people originate out of. It had to start with two or more, right? So you've heard uh, scriptures talk about two or more gathered. Well, here's another example of this. You have to have two people to have a contract, okay? Um, and really, same thing with the trust. Some, many people say you, you, that you need three, um, but I think in the form of a basic trust, really, if I'm the... Uh, grantor when you'll find out about all these things but if i'm the grantor i give it to you as the trustee for me now i am the beneficiary in the end you have the trustee and the beneficiary you have other roles that people play but that's the basics of it nonetheless that's not the point at the moment the point at the moment is your rights came from the from the creator and are equal footing to everyone else's rights and the private express trust at the common law gives you a a look into those original rights and we'll just stop there and we'll open up the book and we'll take a look so here's weiss's trustee handbook here we go weiss's concise trustee handbook a guide to the administration of an express trust under the common law functioning under the general law merchant by carlton albert weiss second edition 2008 Introduction. This handbook is about the administration of express trusts created under the original American common law and functioning within the unique system of commerce in the American states, i.e. the general law merchant, as it stands in the 21st century America. And if we go down to the bottom and we look at the footnote, it says the general law merchant is embraced under general common law, i.e. the original and unique system of commercial law in the American states in which there is in which there is no commerce regulation of express trusts except in connection with income derived from corporate stock and physical franchises under, under Article 1, Section 8, Clause 1 and 3 of the Constitution. See William A. Fletcher, 
the general common law, and section 34 of the judiciary, judiciary, sorry, and of the Judiciary Act of 1789, the example of marine insurance, 97 Harvard Law Review, 1513 and 14, 1984. All right, so we'll go over and we'll take a look at that for a second. Uh, the Harvard Law Review is this right here. Um, and we will try to leave a link below to this, but you, if you search up this right here, General Common Law in the Section 34 of the Judiciary Act of 1789 by William A. Fletcher, you'll find a PDF online that you could check out. Um, nonetheless, I definitely suggest you guys check out all these footnotes. We'll try to look at some things in these footnotes um, to give you an idea of why Carlton was pointing this out. It's very important, you guys. Um, as you saw over here, once again, uh, the general law merchant is embraced under general common law, the original and unique system of commercial law in the American states. So the general law merchant was the unique system of commercial law in the American um, states. But remember, that's not, the, that's not the whole of it, in which there is no commerce regulation of express trusts except in connection with income derived from corporate stock in physical franchises. So if you're running your... Um, operations of your of your existence out of the um, express trusts under the common law then you're using the general law merchant and there's no regulation of commerce using express trusts except in connection with income derived from corporate stock and physical franchises so that's huge you guys if, if you can't grasp that, that what that is at the moment you'll uh, hopefully begin to see it um, you're utilizing forms of law to seek out protections and to seek out new forms of freedom that you didn't know existed um, prior to this. So as you see, there's no statutory regulation of express trust and a trustee um, is protected, as you'll see in the, in the coming paragraphs under Article 1, Section 10 of the Constitution. All right. <clears throat> the material presented herein has been reduced from, from various sources, which the reader is encouraged to examine for his own knowledge and further understanding. The material herein has been rendered into a concise handbook format intended to allow the reader to refer to each section for guidance on decisions regarding the most pertinent aspects of the administration of an express trust. So only secondary attention has been given to all other matters. All in all, the author's objective by this handbook is to devise a simple guide with clearly outlined methods and sample forms for the effective handling of affairs of express trusts, while also showing many, the many options for growth and prosperity and profound protections afforded by express trusts when created and administered properly. This book is written in a somewhat unconventional manner in, in order to accommodate this objective. If the reader should find after examining the sources that this work has failed in, in its objective, then let it be attributed to a fault of the author, not to any supposed faultiness of the sources or the express trust itself. It will be admitted by all honest and learned lawyers as it once was when a lawyer by definition was learned in the law that the express trust, especially one created with proper care to its instruments, is a far superior form of security or organization in general for individuals who desire to exercise their natural rights. So as you heard Carl, uh, Carlton Weiss point out there and emphasize right there, you guys, the express trust it would be admitted by all honest lawyers that the express trust under the common law, especially one created with proper care to its instruments, its documentation, is a far superior form of security or organization in general for individuals who desire to exercise their natural rights. All right. Uh, let's see. Continue on, you guys. First, it must be understood that any trust, regardless of the many designations applied to them, is in its most basic sense a property interest held by one person, the trustee, at the request of another, the settler, for the benefit of a third party, the beneficiary. The classification applied to a trust is, primarily ba is based primarily upon its mode of creation, in which it may be created either by act of a party or by operation of the law. All right, so you heard that again. I'll read that one more time. The classification applied to a trust is based primarily, primarily upon its mode of creation, in which it may be created either by act of a party or by operation of a law, or by operation of the law. So if, um, if something happens and by virtue of the law, 
um, property has to be held in, in custody, custody of a trustee or, or is a constructive trust is created. Um, that's by operation of law. And we'll read about that more later, but a lot of people feel that constructive trusts are happening all over the place. And uh, anyway, we'll leave that for another conversation later. In the case of the former, trusts are, div are divided into two types, express or implied. Without getting into the various subclasses of it, express and implied trusts, the basic difference between one created by the express act of a party and one created by the implied act of a, of a party is that the former is stated fully in language, oral or written, while the latter is inferred solely from the conduct of the parties. These are very generalized definitions, so presented for want of space, since there are many intricacies concerning the true meaning of the term implied. It has been shown that, in a, in a sense, the classification of express trust can only be applied based on what is implied by the language of the trust which created of the instrument which created the trust. So we won't get into that. Our focus is on a particular written express trust type, and even though the above definition is essentially accurate, it does little to define the express trust trust as it is known in its fullest sense under the protections of the common law. All right, so he's basically pointing out that a lot of trust can be created in different ways, express, oral, uh, implied. But in order to uh, afford yourself the full protection of the uh, common law, we would want to express the uh, trust by writing it down and uh, very clearly pointing out um, everything that is desired to be expressed in that trust. All right, express trust under the common law. The most adequate, to, adequate definition of the express trust is to be understood from the earlier case law, which has been elo eloquently summed up and restated into a clear, concise definition by Alfred D. Chandler Esquire in a report submitted to the Tax Commissioners of Massachusetts on unincorporated associations. The study was conducted as part of a legislative investigation into their economic effect on the state in 1911. In the first part of the report, at pages six through seven, he offers the following definition. Express trust put the legal estate entirely in one or more, por in more, one or more persons, while others have a beneficial interest in and out of the same, but are neither partners nor agents. This simple, adequate, common law right, any person or group of persons, su juris, may exercise. The trustees issuing certificates of beneficial and capital interest divided into shares, as well as issuing bonds and other obligations, as freely as they open a, open a bank account, have a passbook, a draw, and circulate checks, or make whatever contractual relations are allowed to persons as a natural right. Uh, it says italics emphasis supplied in original, bold emphasis and bracket information added. What becomes clear from this definition is that the express trust is not merely a property interest held by one for the benefit of another like any basic trust. Rather, it is a trust created by private contract for the holding of a divisible property interest wherein the trustee is empowered by the settler to do for a beneficiary of his, the trustee's, choosing whatever he may do for himself as an individual su juris, which means of one's own right. What has been created here is a trust organization lawfully by natural right. As a general proposition, it may be asserted that one who creates a trust may mold it into whatever form he pleases and that, do, and that whatever one may lawfully do himself, he may authorize another to do for him. All right, so and I wanna point out you guys that when they speak about whatever one may lawfully do himself, he may authorize another to do for him. Uh, you know, it's, it's something to, to think about the, this this trust is operating out of the common law and part of the reasons why the earlier businessmen in the earliest part of uh, the 20th century uh, were utilizing the private express trust uh, as the um, document that they were doing business out of. It was their business organization document. The reason why was because they were able, able to sidestep corporate uh, statutes, statutes that were, sorry, some kind of beat going on. Um, They're able to sidestep statutory regulations upon corporations. Um, and so 
they were utilizing it for that reason. What you'll what you'll soon find is that the trustee is able to do whatever is necessary and proper for the trust, and that no statute may infringe upon that obligation. And so there are a lot of things that you'll see that you may be able to start to recognize you could do in the name of the trust for the purpose of the trust, to expand the trust, to benefit the trust and, and the beneficiaries, to expand the property or whatever is deemed efficient and proper by the trustee, one may do. And statutory uh, and statutes can't get in the way of that obligation. So you start to see how this, this trust format can open up a huge aspect of freedoms for you uh, when you start to see the licenses that are required by statutes and you start to see all the regulation that is brought on by statutes and then you start to see that you can create a trust that enables you to do things outside of the statutory regulation um, and then by being obligated to perform the uh, the trust um, duties the state can't get in the way of those duties so it's basically like that. So if you're, as long as you're not creating a common law uh, injury, if you're not hurting anyone, you're not injuring anyone, you're not breaking contracts, as long as you're not doing things that are injurious to others, then the actions that you do on behalf of the trust, in my opinion, and this is not legal advice, um, you, you stand a very good chance to... Uh, to not be able to be held up in court by a, stat, a statute of a state because that state statute is um, not superior to your trustee obligations. And that's what Article 1, Section 10 of the Constitution is all about. Anyway, we'll continue on. Uh, let's see. All right. So. As a general proposition, it may be asserted that one who creates a trust may mold it into whatever form he pleases and that whatever one may lawfully do himself, he may authorize another to do for him. Doing so requires no benefit, privilege, or franchise from any government or other outside party. So hear that out. And therefore, the parties owe no duty to any government or other outside party to the extent that no common law, criminal, or civil wrong is the purpose of the contract. All right, so you can't make a, a, a common law criminal or civil wrong the purpose. So remember, statutory, what they call criminal law, oftentimes is, uh, has nothing to do with crime, right? All right, when there's, when it, when there's non-injurious crimes that they create and then they cause people to be fined and, and, and have to put up all this sorts of money, uh, now you're talking about a, an oppressive system, potentially, that's robbing the people off of statutory uh, rules and regulations that have nothing to do with actual crimes. So you start to see where the fact that the, the operating out, out of a trust, out of a private express trust, puts you outside of that jurisdiction. All right, let's see if there's anything in the... Uh, footnotes that we want to read to you guys because I would certainly suggest when you guys download this um, handbook you read every bit of the footnotes you guys it is very very good information in there but I'm going to just pick and choose here all right President Woodrow Wilson's address before the American Bar Association uh, he says liberty is always personal never aggregate always a thing inherit and hearing in individuals taking singly, never in groups or corporations or communities. The individual unit of society is the individual. So that's what uh, we've been talking about for a while, you guys. So when we, when we see the word individual under statutory law, you could think of that as a slice of the franchise, right? A slice of the, of the corporation. And you're just exercising the privilege of being whatever that individual uh, franchise E, if you will, is. So that might be a resident of a state. Um, but an individual is the individual unit of society. Uh, initially, right when the when the when the Constitution first began, uh, you probably had yourself uh, free state citizens, and then as things began to take shape, you had more and more rights taken away and traded into privileges and all sorts of uh, deceptions. But nonetheless, we continue on. It has been long held by the. Uh, it has long been held that trustees of express trusts have greater latitude than ordinary trustees, simply because such trusts 
created by individuals, sui juris, may do whatever individuals, sui juris, may do. A person who creates a trust may mold it into whatever form he pleases. All right. And Hale versus Hankel is referred uh, at number 11, where uh, he talks about doing so requires no benefit, privilege, or franchise from any government or outside party. So if you guys haven't checked out Hale versus Hankel, it's very much uh, worth the case to check out. Um, you start to see that uh, when uh, a man doesn't take on benefits and privileges, then uh, he doesn't owe a right or, or anything to uh, to any government to, to declare his paperwork and, and, to, and to basically allow himself to be subject to investigation and scrutiny. He starts to take on benefits. And he starts to take on uh, liabilities at that point, regulatory uh, duties. All right. When done properly, the trust is afforded all the common law protections ordinarily given to private contracts, particularly, particularly the obligation of them. And that's when he refers 13 uh, down below. It says in Barry versus McCork, the court held that the express trust is a contractual relationship based on the trust form. And in Smith versus Morse, two Cal, uh, two Cal 524, it was held that any law or procedure in its operation Denying or obstructing contract rights impairs the contractual obligation, obligation and is therefore violative of Article 1, Section 10 of the Constitution. Because the express trust is created by the exercise of the natural right to contract, which cannot be abridged, the agreement, when executed, becomes protected under federally enforceable right of contract law and not under laws passed by any of the several state legislatures. In Elliott versus Freeman, 220 U.S. 178 in 1911, the court made it clear that the express trust is not subject to legislative control. Hear that, you guys? The express trust is not subject to legislative control. Let me say it one more time. In Elliott versus Freeman, 220 U.S. 178, 1911, the court made it clear that the express trust is not subject to legislative control. It went further to acknowledge that the right-wise stance of the United States Supreme Court that the trust relationship comes under the realm of equity based upon the common law right of contract and is not subject to legislative restrictions as are corporations and other organizations created by legislative authority. And I'll even throw in the word individuals there because individuals of society are created by legislative authority. To clarify the equity and common law distinctions, now listen, you guys, this whole last paragraph is huge. To clarify the equity and, co and common law distinctions, the basis for express trusts under the common law in this instance is not that such organizations are creatures of common law as distinguished from equity, but that they are created under the common law of contracts and do not depend upon any statute. Okay, so I hope you guys took that whole last uh, paragraph in it. It's enormous. All right, let's continue. The declaration, uh, I'm sorry. All right. Now the question is whether the parties to the contract are truly acting sujuris of their pure, unadulterated, common law, natural rights. Because if the parties import or associate benefits which grant an outside party a vested interest in the proposed contract, then the contract has acquired a third party overseer slash intervener. Okay, and that's when he put, points out uh, Lee Brops. If you haven't checked out Lee Brops, USA, the Republic in, is the house that no one lives in. I'd highly suggest you check that out. It's an amazing, amazing uh, treatise, if you will, by Lee Brops. Um, our, rest in peace, Lee. Um, all right, so yeah, we were, I was just speaking on the, on, the, on the call last night with uh, one of my brothers in, in, in this movement. Um, I'll keep his name um, private for now. Um, but nonetheless, uh, he was pointing out uh, just this very thing. And he was talking about the Federal Reserve notes, how it was his opinion that the Federal Reserve note uh, allowed a... Uh, the title of the purchased property to go into the hands of the Federal Reserve while we just had equitable use of it. And that's an interesting uh, theory for sure that certainly is more than plausible. As uh, Carlton Weiss is pointing out right here, 
Uh, oftentimes people think that they are acting of their own right, of their pure, unadulterated common law natural rights, but if they start using outside benefit, uh, such as Federal Reserve notes, uh, then you're importing outside benefits, benefits which could produce a result of outside interest, best, uh, interest in this con contract that you've created. It's not a, a pure bilateral contract between yourself, the grantor, and whoever the trustee may be, and whatever ways you that you create this trust. Uh, you don't want to bring in outside benefits uh, into this contract, you guys. So that's why, as you read this uh, document, you'll you'll see that. Carlton suggests that you use um, some gold as a uh, way of um, placing some property into the trust that is what they call portable land, as uh, Carlton Weiss points out, portable land. So the Constitution and its protections go with the land. And so <clears throat> this being a form of portable land and, and, and a value that is not created by third party um, benefit. And so because of that, he says that that is the best form of um, property or res of the trust that you're going to be able to use to create a, a solid trust. All right. Declaration of the Express Trust. The Declaration of Trust is the trust inst instrument that constitutes the trust. It has been noted in trust law that no technical expressions are required to create a valid declaration so long as the words make used make clear the settler's intent to create the trust or confer a benefit of some sort that would be best carried out in the form of a trust. A trust instrument does, does not necessarily need to be a declaration either, for a trust may be and often is formed out of a simple agreement or even a will. But with an express trust, the declaration has been pre preferred since the beginnings of trusts under the common law of England, which otherwise shunned fictions of law. So, you, hear, you heard it right there, you guys. Um, it has been, uh, the declaration has been the preferred uh, method for creating express trust since the beginnings of trusts themselves under the common law of England, which otherwise shunned fictions of law. We're, we're, we're swimming in fictions of law right now, you guys, in, in this 2019 and for a long time. We've been swimming in fictions of law. We need to get ourselves out of this fictions of law and get ourselves back into natural rights. Okay, so let's continue. This is where careful attention to detail is most crucial because in order to properly construe the intent of the settler, the objects, the property and manner in which all is to be carried out must be set forth in unambig unambiguous, precise language so as, to particularly create, so as to particularly create the express trust. And where the intent of the settler is unclear, under equity, interpretation is required to construe the intent of the parties, and the trust may be deemed invalid depending on the degree of ambigu ambiguity. However, when all is done properly, obviously there can be no lawful impairment of the obligations of a contract. And again, he points out, see the, see the United States Constitution, Article 1, Section 10 from 1789. Uh, no state may pass any law that impairs the obligation of a contract. All right, so... Big, big things, you guys, there. All right, so moreover, the declaration by its terms and provisions serves to establish the entire contractual arrangement, including the identities and positions of the parties, the trust's name, jurisdiction, and situs, and all particulars of administration, all of which the, all of which the courts of equity will fully support by the principle that equity compels performance. The ultimate result is the creation of a, of a bona fide legal entity with its own separate and distinct juridical per personality withstanding to sue and be sued and to function as a person in commerce by and through its trustees. So the trust is the person. Ah, you see that, you guys? The trust, um, the trust itself is the person, and it's operated by its trustees who then are uh, taking protections uh, under Article 1, Section 10, and as um, as state citizens, right? They're 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 persons in a sense, but they're not the persons in commerce. The the trust is the commerce instrument, and the trustees are acting as a man or a woman, right? The, so here we go. Let's let's continue on. The term natural person has been applied to express trusts by courts of equity because of its because of its administration being carried out by men acting as natural persons. All right, so let's go down here. 
to number 24 because you're going to you're going to you're going to sit there and you're going to question well, well who's the person right is the trust the person is, is is the trustee the person well let's go down here and look at what he has and there's a footnote because you're going to blow your mind here right right now this this is this is huge you guys we were talking about this last night on the call all right check this out a generally unknown fact is that there are several types of citizens now existing in america the trustees of an express trust may seek protection under the constitution as state citizens throughout the union of states a jurisdiction outside the scope of the 14th amendment which we will discuss in a later section however it should be it should also be noted i'm sorry it should also be noted of all citizenship 14th amendment or otherwise that jurisdiction over natural and artificial persons is distinguished without a fundamental difference this stems surprisingly from the operation of in rem jurisdiction which underlies all civil law all right you guys so that right there should blow your mind uh, in, in two different ways that state citizens can come in as a i'm sorry that a trustees of an express trust can come under the protections of a, as a state citizen outside the scope of the 14th amendment that should blow your mind and then we have it should also be noted of all citizenship, 14th Amendment or otherwise, that jurisdiction over natural and artificial persons is distinguished without a fundamental difference because of the operation, and that's key word again, operation of in rem jurisdiction, which underlies all civil law. So, okay, so you sit here and you think to yourself, well, what are you talking about, Greg, about operation? Well, in rem, in rem means thing. So we have uh, uh, talking about things. And uh, we're not talking about men and women when we talk about things, but they're talking about the court gains jurisdiction over 14th Amendment or otherwise persons, natural or artificial, through the operation of in rem jurisdiction, which underlies what? All civil law. So why are we talking about just civil law? Is it just civil law? Yes, Greg. Well, check it out. Though all courts are familiar with the action in personam, against persons it is the action in rem against things which though practiced only in maritime law that's law of the sea stealthily operates there it is again operates remember operation of law you guys it's it's it, operations of law happen as a, a one two three you do this this happens you give jurisdiction you they presume it you give it or whatever it did, the operations that happen as a result of actions then creates things so let's continue stealthily operates in every civil and criminal court let me read that again though all courts are familiar with the actions in personam against persons it is the actions in rem against things which though practiced though practiced only in maritime law, stealthily, meaning hidden, operates, meaning it's in the operation of the, cog, uh, the, the cogs of the wheel, right, of the machine of this courtroom. So it's only practiced openly in maritime law, in REM, only practiced openly in maritime law. It stealthily, covertly, hidden, operates in every, every, not just one or two in every civil and criminal court. I apologize, you guys, for for um, being so adamant about this, but you guys got to see this. This is principle is one of the least understood in its entirety. Okay, why is it least understood? We have a an action against things, you guys, in every court case that you deal with. Every court case you go to is dealing with an in rem jurisdiction. Is what is being told to you right now every single court case not one not two not three everyone which which one's greg civil or criminal both civil and criminal how is it happening greg let's continue in rem meaning things jurisdiction over a man or woman can only exist if the man or woman is a slave i.e property or res an object in which case his or her disposition at law is no different than if he or she were a horse or other goods. See the Zong, Gregson versus Gilbert, 99 ER 3, uh, colons 233 KB 1783. So he's giving you a court case. If you want to go check it out, I've read it. It's pretty wild. But we're talking about the Zong court case, um, Gregson versus Gilbert. All right, let's continue on. In nature, 
in rem jurisdiction is exercised over men and women by their creator exclusively. Okay. So you're the creation of your creator. And that's the only one who could treat you, if, if you will, as a, um, a sub what they are. And I don't mean that in a negative way. So please do not take that in a negative way. No one, he's saying, on this earth can treat you as a slave. He's saying your creator is the only one who could ever say, I have some jurisdiction over you in those ways. Maybe not to make you my slave in the way that commonly is thought of as a slave. But again, no man or woman can be doing, can do that over another. So let's, how does it happen then? How in the courts is in rem jurisdiction exercised over men and women? So it says governments can only therefore gain a fictional in rem jurisdiction, a what? A fictional in rem jurisdiction over men by creating various legal devices. What are those called? Personas or persons for those men to assume limited control of. So to assume limited control. Well, there you go again. Oh, we were talking about that last night, uh, but here it is again. If you're assuming limited control over these personas, that means they're not yours. That means that the legal title is not in your hands. You have equitable use over these persons that are created by the government for you to assume limited control, probably as a beneficiary, right? And then they, and I've heard them flip, uh, flip it around and make you the trustee. And I'm sure they got ways to do that. And they make you liable. But what are those persons? We have citizen, taxpayer, driver, et cetera, et cetera. Since the device is legal fiction, a falsehood made true by force of law, this persona is in fact a legal object or res. Let me read that again. Since the device, the person, the legal person is legal fiction, a what? A legal fiction, a falsehood made true by force of law. So it wasn't until law came in that this happened and it made this legal fiction of which you took limited control over and this persona is in fact a legal object. What did they say? This persona, this person, right? All statutes, if you see, always are against the persons. So you're not that person. You assume limited control over that legal person. This persona is in fact a legal object or res. Just as, in, just as in theater, the persona or person is separate from the man or woman playing the part. Therefore, there may be artificial persons, but not artificial men. Natural persons, but not natural men. This is out of American Law and Procedure, Volume 13, ch Chapter 5, Section 65, pages 156 through 157. You guys, this section right here is out of American Law and Procedure. It's not Greg's words. This is their words. They gain in-rem in jurisdiction over people stealthily, creating an impersonum jurisdiction when you go in and show interest in that name or in that person, in that legal device. Again, this is not legal advice, you guys. This is just, just take a look at the facts. We're figuring out and we need to figure out and we need to show people how to, how to recognize that you are not that legal person. They've created these persons for you to assume limited control over and, and, and pay the price of when they want to haul that person into court and you think it's you let me read on you guys the word person defined gaius says de juris divisione the divisions of the law immediately preceding his division of the law then follows de conditione hominum hominum meaning the condition or status of men all right so now you're going to learn some more stuff you guys and we're going, to, we're going to stop after this chapter and we'll continue on with another video because this is enough to take in to blow your minds for the night. And really, I know a lot of you guys have heard these things and seen these things, but I'll read on. In the Institutes de Jura Personarum precedes the expression, all our civil law relates either to persons or to things or to actions. The words persona and personae 
did not have the meaning in the Roman, which attaches to homo, the individual, or a man in the English. It had, it had peculiar reference to artificial beings and the condition or status of individuals. All right. The word person in its primitive and natural sense signifies the mask with, with which actors who played dramatic pieces in Rome and Greece covered their heads. These pieces were played in public places and afterwards in such vast amphitheaters that it was impossible for a man to make himself heard by all the spectators and later by all the judges. Recourse was had to art. The head of each actor was enveloped with a mask, the figure of which represented the part he was to play. And it was so contrived that the opening for the emission of his voice made the sound clearer and more resounding. Vax Paranabat. I'm not sure for sure if I'm pronouncing that right. When the name persona was given to the instrument or mask which facilitated the resounding of his legal voice, the name persona was applied afterwards to the part itself which the actor had undertaken to play. Because the face of the mask was adopted to the age and character of him who was, con who was considered as speaking, and sometimes it was his own portrait. It is in this last sense of personage or of the part which an individual plays that the word persona is employed in jurisprudence in opposition to the word man. When we speak of a person, we only consider the state of the man, the part he plays in society abstractly without considering the individual. First Bouvier's Institute, note one. All right, you guys, so we're gonna then go on to the, this last section. It says, logic follows that if man plays no part in a society, then he has no personal attachment or obligation thereto. The trustees under a declaration of an express trust are only persons in the private sense because he only is a person once he has accepted the role offered to him by the settler. Private persons may also pursue constitutional protections as natural persons. Citizens within the meaning of Article 4, Section 2 of the Constitution, and may thereby claim entitlement to all the privileges and immunities of the same. We're not talking about 14th Amendment privileges and immunities, folks. We're talking about Article 4, Section 2 of the Constitution, state citizen privileges and immunities. See generally Paul versus Virginia, 75 U.S. 168, uh, 1868. It says, even though in today's economic situation, the term citizen is presumed to signify the 14th Amendment citizen, the term cannot be applied to express trusts when administered properly. In contrast, corporations as artificial persons are citizens of the United States within the meaning of the 14th Amendment per Santa Clara County versus Southern Pacific Railroad County. And uh, yeah, you guys, um, I think there was a, a case recently, I can't re think of the name of it right now. Uh, gosh, it's, it was huge, but it had all to do with the corporations being persons and being able to influence um, political parties. You guys can leave the uh, name in the underneath in the comments. Anyway, whew, I'm out of breath, you guys. We're on page eight of 79, so we got a long ways to go. Um, but yeah, this is enormous, you guys. You guys got to check out this book right here, uh, Carlton Weiss's uh, Private Express Trustee Handbook. All right, enjoy, take care, peace and blessings.